Oh, there are a lot of you out there. <laughs> All right. Well, first of all, uh, I want to first of all thank Susan and um, the entire staff and leadership of the 92nd Street Y. Isn't this a wonderful institution? I think they deserve a round of applause. And of course, thank you, Leader Pelosi, for uh, for coming down and doing this. I, I, you know, I have to start by asking you, where did you acquire your power to swing and direct every election in the United States? <laughs> Where did this power come from? And can you use it to get me the winning lottery? <laughs> but well, in, in all seriousness, I want to let, before we get into some of the, because maybe you're not going to tell me where you got that power, because it's true, I, I may not use it for good. Um, I want to talk a little bit about you. Tell me a little bit about your background, because you are so associated with San Francisco, but in reality, you're a Baltimore girl. Well, both. Well, thank you. Well, first of all, I want to join you in thanking everyone at the 92nd Street Y. It's always wonderful to be here tonight on a Sunday evening. It's sort of we're in each other's living room. I'm happy that my husband Paul is here, my daughter Alexandra, her husband Mahil, and my grandchildren Thomas and Paul, uh, because this is about the future. It's, it, I'm so proud to be here. I was so excited to be coming, and especially since we're right in the heart of a fight on the Affordable Care Act. But Joy says we'll get to that shortly. <laughs> and I'm particularly honored to be here with Joy. Aren't we proud of her? Aren't we proud of her? Oh, thank you. You too. Thank you, darling. <laughs> and we love all of you. <laughs> the, uh, very quickly, because I know we want to hear from the audience pretty soon, uh, I was born in Baltimore, Maryland. When I was born, my father was a member of Congress from uh, Maryland uh, in the Congress of the United States. Uh, he was a new dealer. He went in, well, before I was born, but he went in and uh, was an avid supporter of Franklin Roosevelt, worship, worshipped at the shrine of Franklin Roosevelt. Anyway. <laughs> I tell you that because this is one thing that many people don't know. When I became speaker, I went to uh, Israel for the first time as speaker. I had been there many times. And the, they wrote this big article in the paper there about Nancy Pelosi comes by her support for it, Israel naturally. And they talked about my father when he was a New Deal congressman, again before I was born, and then I was born um, while he was there that he, again, worshipped at the Shrine of Franklin Roosevelt, but he had two areas of disagreement, and they point out that that could have been a problem for him in his relationship with the president. One was he disagreed with the president on the treatment of, of how our country was dealing with the treatment of Jews in, in Europe. He was saying we should be doing more, and, and the other was uh, that he wanted our country to, to more um, uh, vocally and sooner support the establishment of a Jewish state in Palestine. He was, part, he was part of a group called the Berkson Group, and they did rallies and pageants and parades. And, um, and when we stood up on the floor of Congress, I, I stand here as a representative of the, of the uh, members of the Jewish army. I mean, he was really way out there on all of it. And uh, he was a great orator. He couldn't read a speech to save his life. I mean, that would be like, what? but he could orate, <laughs> and so he, he was in demand to do those things. So it was in, in that spirit of if you believe in something, you must act upon your beliefs, and you have to take risks to do it, even to possibly uh, weaken your relationship with the President of the United States. So he was born then when he, uh, when I was in first grade, he became the mayor of Baltimore. When I went away to college in my first year, whole first year of college, he was still the mayor of Baltimore. So that was what I grew up that 12 years in a home that was always about um, our responsibilities to other people. Uh, just to, when I was born, I would say I was born into a family that was devoutly Catholic, fiercely patriotic, deeply proud of our Italian-American heritage, and staunchly democratic. <laughs> <laughs> and we saw the relationship between our faith and our responsibilities and the responsibility to community in that way. 
Growing up, I read things that say I always wanted to be in politics. I never wanted to be in politics. <laughs> I just wanted to be a 50s teenager, you know, rock around the clock, the whole thing. Elvis, oh my God. So, uh, uh, but then I went to Trinity College in Washington and Paul Pelosi was at Georgetown. We met and married. He was born and raised in San Francisco. We moved to New York. My New York bona fides, four of our five children were born at New York Lying In Hospital here in New York. <laughs> and when, uh, when the oldest of the four was four, and we had four children, uh, Paul, uh, we moved home for Paul to, uh, that would be home, his home in San Francisco. And that was a long time ago. In San Francisco is where Alexandra was born. She's the only one who lives in New York. And <laughs> <laughs> But the others are in Texas, Arizona, you know, they're all over. But um, I prayed for grandchildren, but I forgot to pray that they lived down the street. But nonetheless, <laughs> we're very proud to have them. And by the way, proud mom, Alexandra's having one of her 11th documentary on uh, the documents of our country, the uh, Declaration of Independence and the Constitution coming out on HBO on the 4th of July. So I'm very proud of that. So, so you, well, you came into Congress um, in 1987, um, and so you have experienced, um, let's just say, the relationships in Congress that people sort of have a big nostalgia. People, uh, you know, there's a lot of claims that what is broken down in Congress in terms of the comity between Democrats and Republicans wasn't like that before, that you know, at the time that you came into Congress, there was a lot more communication. Is that true, or are we mythologizing politics in a way that this sort of makes us feel better, but this isn't accurate. Both. <laughs> the thing is, is of course we had a little better rapport then, there's no question. The politics of personal destruction really began with Newt Gingrich mm -hmm. in the 90s against the Clintons, and that sort of took us to a different, down a different path. And as you know, I'm the victim of, of all of that as well. But apart from that, this, in the history of our country, and that's why I was proud of what Alexandra was doing, the history of our country since the beginning, our founders, our founders, they wrote this beautiful constitution where they had the preamble, all the possibilities of our country, and how it is done by a system of checks and balances, separation of powers. And that's really the heart of what I'm concerned, part of what I'm concerned about what's happening now. So then it was a spectrum up until the last dozen years, it was a spectrum where you were in terms of the role of government, more government, less government, more national government, more local government, and that was the debate you had, and you went to Congress confident in your views, humble enough to listen to other people, wanting to find common ground so that you could have uh, sustainability in your solutions. Uh, but we had a range where we could find common ground. Now, what you could have all the comedy in the world, you could laugh at each other's jokes and have dinner together and the rest, but the fact is that the policies that they are advocating do not even come close to meeting the needs of the American people. And so we have a drastic debate. That doesn't mean that we're not courteous to each other, nice to each other and that, but that doesn't mean that that's gonna change anybody's mind about their constant uh, call to their North Star trickle down economics, tax cuts for the rich so that you can have, uh, and if, if it trickles down, that would be good. If it doesn't, so be it. That's the free market. At, at the same time, we can't let the deficit grow, so we've got to reduce the deficit, and you see a budget that should be a statement of our national values. Mm -hmm. about what's important to us as a country should be how we allocate our resources, and you have a budget that the president put forth that cuts one-fifth of the National Institutes of Health, $7 billion. 30% of our State Department budget, our soft power, our cooperation with other countries and the rest, and the list goes on. Talk about infrastructure, cut the transportation budget. The list goes on and on. And when you see the health care bill, which we will get to, <laughs> I hope maybe more fully, the health care bill, which is the biggest transfer of wealth in the history of our country, in the, the House bill, which even the president calls mean, sucks up $600 billion 
from working families to the wealthiest families in our country and corporate America. So uh, how could that be right? We are taking away opportunity and benefits for people using the money for tax cuts, which have only uh, uh, increases the deficit, does not create jobs, and all, then calls them to say, we've got to cut food stamps, and we've got to cut you know, all of the investments in the future. Education, innovation begins in the classroom. You cut education, how are we going to be number one? And by the way, and I'll end with this for this question, nothing brings more money to the treasury, does more to reduce the deficit than investments in education. Early childhood. <laughs> early childhood, K through 12, higher education, post-grad, lifetime learning. That is how you reduce the deficit. You have to have good paying jobs, and of course that's the fight that we are in. We have to articulate that point better. But it, there's a big difference as to where we are. Just look at the budget, just look at, the, um, at, the, at, at what they're doing in the health care bill. One more thing I will say, because we, when President Bush was president, and I was the minority leader, and then when I was the speaker when he was president, we worked together and got a great deal accomplished, even though I think that the, going into the war in Iraq was one of the worst decisions our country has ever made. But it, as bad as that was, he's the president. We worked together helping poor kids, PEPFAR, uh, biggest energy bill in the history of our country. So many things, uh, the list goes on and on. We never said, because he wasn't a Democrat, as Mitch McConnell did of President Obama, we have to make sure uh, that he doesn't succeed and is only a one-term president. So it is, I don't think that there's really, uh, people say, oh, both sides. It isn't both sides. It isn't about um, dysfunction, it's about obstruction. And that's what they were doing. We're looking to find ways to work with the president for infrastructure, for inf uh, tax reform, and even some things he said this morning that I heard, I, I didn't actually see him, about working together uh, to make sure that we uh, do not hurt people and whatever happens in the health care reform, work together in a bipartisan way to do that. Yeah. Well, you, you mentioned um, the fact that you were, in fact, a majority leader um, just before the 2006... Min minority. Minority leader, sorry, minority leader, just before the 2006 election um, that wound up making you speaker. Um, I note that at that time, when that election took place, while, despite the fact that you had the same job that you have now, mm -hmm. Um, the credit for that election actually went to Rahm Emanuel, who was the DCCC. No, no, the sort of conventional wisdom was that he did that, right? No, and then you became speaker. <laughs> well, maybe. Well, no, he, he, got, he got and deserves yeah. credit for the role that he played. Sure. But, but do you? But do you find that as a woman wielding power and real, wielding the most power that any woman has ever wielded um, yeah. in this country's history as Speaker of the House, is there a specific challenge in terms of a woman? leading politically in this country? Do we still have a problem with just a general sense that women aren't given the same kind of credit a man would get and that a woman's leadership is, is put to a different sort of question than a man's? Well, of course. <laughs> but let me just say a couple things. First of all, uh, when, uh, when Susan was saying that I was um, the highest ranking woman, the night of the election, I thought at long last, as nice as that title is, we were going to have a woman president of the United States. And that was, that was everything. I mean, a very talented person who happens to be a woman to be the president of the United States. And so I, you know, I, I kind of, when, when they say that, I'm like, oh no, I wish it weren't true. I wish I were not the highest ranking woman. But I would say this, uh, women are always willing to get the job done by allowing other people to take credit. And, um, and that, that goes a long way. You know, that really does go a long way. On the other hand, what you see is you really do have to assert yourself, as I just did, and said, no, I was planning that long before Rahm Emanuel was elected to And Congress. you gave him that position. I mean, by I the way, you were appointed. No, and and Rahm is you. wonderful. It's not to take anything away sure. from him. But we in our California, we decided that we were going to change what was happening because we were tired of losing. We had lost in 94, 96, 98. And in 2000, I said to the leadership in Congress, look, 
I'm tired of losing. We want to take over California. You, you know, you, I know it. I was chair of the party. I know the grassroots of California down to the last blade of grass. We will, we will make sure the candidates are appropriate for their districts. We'll raise the money. We, at 2000, going into the 2000 election, we were 26 Democrats, 26 Republicans. In redistricting, reapportionment, we picked up one more member. Right now, we are at 39 Democrats and 14 Republicans. So, so we had a, a political path and we knew it would take an enormous amount of progressive money to get the job done to elect a Democratic Congress. So we had this all on this path. And we went to the private sector. I went to the private sector and said, how, if you're number two in the private sector and you want to be number one, if you're whatever, Excedrin, Advil, whatever, whatever's two and whatever's one, how do you get to be number one? And they gave us a path. So we had our outside structure in terms of the private sector. We had our fundamentals in order by having California so far down the road with so many more members. The, the uh, money thing coming, California really, and I say this with some in modesty, New York very significant as well. But we had a plan. Mm -hmm. And the and funny thing is they made me prove everything. Every time I would say we raise this money, they say, show us the checks. We have to show you the checks. You know, because they, yeah. they're not going to let me get not gonna take down their path. Yeah. Yeah. But Ron was wonderful. He came in. I appointed him right away uh, to um, the second term to, to do that. He, he was remarkable. But that's what it takes, a team. It isn't one person saying, yeah. Don't do anything unless you call me. It, it's, you have this responsibility. We'll make sure it's funded. We have the outside resources intellectually in terms of the private sector. So it's the intellectual resources, the political student, astuteness, and the finances to mobilize people at the grassroots level. We are stand ready to do that again. And I just make this point, because we're talking about when mm -hmm. Bush was president, when this or that. When Bush, President Bush was president and I was minority leader, and Harry Reid was minority leader, we had a big voice because there was a Republican in the White House. When we won, we had big voices too because now we're the majority, but in majority or minority, we're the opposition party. We had a big voice. Once the pre we had a Democrat in the White House, thank God, <laughs> wonderful Barack Obama, then... The role of the Congress, if it's the same party as the president, is greatly diminished. So then they come after us, and, and um, they had a strong voice because there was a Democrat in the White House, Republican leadership. Now it comes back to us. Chuck Schumer, aren't you proud of Chuck Schumer here in New York? And, uh, and the... Um, and, me <laughs> and I, Chuck and I, and, and we are listening, putting together the message as we go forward. But remember this, we didn't have the spotlight until for a long, you know, since a long time, and then the spotlight was on our president. And so when you have a president in the White House, that's the main attraction. We're the lounge act. <laughs> People probably don't even show up for it, right? But, but, um, but now uh, we take that responsibility as we go forward. Uh, we had a presidential race. That's part of what, that's the main event. That is really the main event. We are the lounge act in that election. And it didn't work out. And that, that now we are building and validating what really is the message that as we go forward. You probably could put it on a piece of paper right now and say this is what it should be. For us, we have to make sure that our members participate in that, that people outside participate in that, that we listen and people participate because it's interesting to see what might be great in my district might not really be great in the yeah. districts that we, have to, that we have to win. So I'm very optimistic about how we go forward. And just one more point. When Clinton was president, the Republicans won. When Bush was president, the Democrats won. When Obama was president, the Republicans won. Mm -hmm. So history is on our side. There's no slam dunk. When we won with Rahm at the helm in the um, DCCC and all that we were doing outside, and, and uh, beyond that, it was strategic, cold-blooded in terms of uh, selection mm -hmm. of candidates and the rest of that. 
clear-eyed about what we, uh, what we needed to do, and that's what we will do. Again, helped by technology that is 12 years down the road there to uh, well, communicate. You know, it, it's interesting that in, in that 2010 election, uh, Michael Steele, good friend, um, he was on the show today, and he was pretty blunt about the fact that in 2010, um, as head of the Republican National Committee, he decided he did not want to have that midterm race be a referendum on Barack Obama for a lot of reasons. He's the first black president. He didn't want the Republicans to be running against Obama. So he decided to run against you. He decided to make Fire Pelosi the theme of the campaign and make you the sort of face of the party and to literally to just target you as the image. What do you make of Democrats now picking up that ball? Not, not, all, not all Democrats, Very but true. a small, yeah, a number of sort of progressives saying, you are the problem. You are the person who is responsible for us losing elections. How, I mean, after all that you've yeah. led the party to, how do you feel when you hear that? Well, let me just say of Michael Steele, who's my friend, he's from yeah, Mar great Maryland guy. and all the rest. I don't, I mean, maybe he did that. I think it was huge money coming from outside with a uh, congressional campaign oh, committee. Yeah. Absolutely. And maybe the DN RNC had something to do with that. But here's the thing about that. That was the first election where uh, Citizens United weighed in. Endless, dark money came in there. And what Michael didn't say, assuming he's responsible for this, is one of the main things that I was getting in terms of threats and all the rest of it is, you're working with Barack Obama. So subtly, yeah. they were putting out there as part of why I should not be the speaker. And of course, a lot of it was about the Affordable Care Act as well, mm -hmm. because they were running against that. But we had everybody running against. We had Wall Street, because we did Dodd-Frank. We had uh, climate was my, my flagship issue as speaker. So we had fossil fuel industry after us. We had uh, an anti-government forces against us in a dark anti-labor, anti-environment, anti-woman's right to choose, anti-gun safety, big money rolling in. Some of those organizations have money all of them are funded by the big dark money. So that was, um, uh, in April of that year, people would have said there's no way the Republicans can win because they don't have the candidates and they don't have the money. But when the Senate failed to pass the Disclose Act, more, you know, it's more specific, that you didn't have to reveal where the money came from, boom, mm -hmm. it just flowed in. And we have to reduce the role of money in politics. It's just one of the, we really, We have a dare, disclose, where does this money come from? Um, a, amend the Constitution to overturn Citizens United. It's hard, but we have to do it. <laughs> R, reform, reform so that when our system rewards small donors, whether it's tax credits or whatever it is, so that people understand that their contribution will make a difference. And E, empower, and one of the things we're doing with, with Eric Holder and President Obama, et cetera, and uh, the Governor's Association, Terry McAuliffe, is to empower, to stop this voter suppression, stop this redistricting that is so unfair. <laughs> Take them to court. Take them to court. And so, uh, again, we, you know, I'm a successful attractor of support from the progressives across the country. Mm -hmm. This isn't about raising money from corporate America, you know, people, some of the Democrats are saying, well, she raises money, who wants us to depend on corporate America? Corporate America doesn't come anywhere near me except to put money in against me. <laughs> this is about progressives across America who believe in a better future for our children and the rest. So um, when you say, how do I feel about it? I don't think you should allow the other party to choose your leaders. And, <laughs> and they, the Republicans would not have come up against me if they didn't think I was effective. Effective as a legislature, legislator to pass the Affordable Care Act, or effective as, as a, on the political arena in terms of attracting support around the country. So they had to take me down. And while they want to look like it's anti-Nancy, if you saw the calls and the hate and all the rest that comes to my, came to my home and to, to all of us, and she works with him. Mm -hmm. She works with him. But so, does it bother you when progressives pick up that same line and say, well, you should stand down because the other side targets you, so therefore we need you to step I don't think I just don't think that's smart. But to tell you the honest truth, 
Right now, I am so totally consumed in the Affordable Care Act and preserving it and stopping them <laughs> from what they're doing that I just have to kind of save that for another day. Yeah. I serve at the pleasure of my caucus. My caucus is very supportive of me. If there's some for their own personal ambition or whatever who want to be on TV, God bless them for that. <laughs> but I can't take my eye off the ball, yeah. which is to stop what is happening in the Senate. And if I just may. I'm yeah, I was going to say, let's get, let's get right, right to the Affordable Care Act, because I, I know you have a. I have one quote. I, I said I don't usually bring any notes mm -hmm. to this, but I want to make sure you know that I am reading this exactly. Mm -hmm. This is from someone named Bruce Siegel. He's president of Essential Hospitals. And this is what he says. There has never been a rollback of basic services to Americans like this ever in US history. Let's not mince words. This bill will close hosp hospitals, will close hospitals. It will hammer rural hospitals. It will close nursing homes. It will lead to disabled children not getting services. People will die. That's what they have on the table. And all of this to give a tax break to the wealthiest people and corporations in America. It's just not right. It's just not right. He didn't say that. I said that last yeah. time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I think what people, when you look at this process, first of all, it's been so fast. I mean, the Affordable Care Act had hearings all through the summer. Ten Every, months. Ten, ten months, months of hearings. hearings. Hundreds of, I think over, what, 150 amendments considered? 150 Republican amendments. Republican amendments considered. Mm -hmm. Hearing after hearing after hearing. We're talking about in a matter of a couple of months, pushing this through. Mitch McConnell wants to vote next Thursday. Yeah. So I think a lot of people who were just sort of jarred by the speed of it. Is there anything that the public that opposes this bill, and across the board, people hate, the, you know, if polls say they don't like the bill. Is there anything people can do about it? Thank you very much for that question. <laughs> what we're doing right now, it, right now, is a story storm. Uh, I'm so proud of the outside groups, you know, so many of them. If I start naming them, I won't name all of them. So right. all of the, uh, the progressive uh, social media, they are just, they help defeat uh, the Republican bill in the House when it lost. What did they do but move further away from people, further to the right, off the scale of any decency? And when they did that, they made matters worse for the American people but made our argument stronger. The message clearly, it's going to cost you more to get fewer benefits. There's going to be an age tax. You could pay five times as much, perhaps, if you're 50 to 64. 23 million people are, will lose their insurance, and Medicare will be undermined. When they went further to the right, our message then became, became they're going to take away your essential benefits for pre-existing medical conditions, all of that, uh, people with disabilities, prescription drugs, hospital stay, maternity care, prenatal care, all of that no longer essential benefits. And uh, so uh, when Mitch, Mitch only started this in the dark just a while ago, after he saw how unpopular the House bill was. But just getting back to the groups for a moment, these groups carried that message so strongly on the social media, two town hall meetings, uh, two offices and the rest, rallies uh, all over. I mean, without them, we could do our inside maneuvering all we want, but without the outside mobilization of people's voices, because nothing is more eloquent to a member of Congress than the voice of his or her own constituent, and they amplified those voices. So if you have a story to tell about yourself or your neighbor, please go to Facebook, Twitter, whatever, Instagram, any platform that you want. My story that I tell all the time is, there's a little girl, Zoe Madison Lynn. She was born with a congenital heart disease condition. She had her first heart operation before she was 15 hours old. By the time she was only a few months old, she was halfway, she had three operations, she was halfway to using her whole lifetime limit that the insurance company would pay for. By the time she before she went to kindergarten, she had used it all up. Used up all the a lifetime of coverage mm -hmm. before preschool. 
before kindergarten, I mean. So with the Affordable Care Act, and then she would have a pre-existing medical condition for the rest of her life, which would probably deprive her family, or at least her, to be excluded from any coverage. The Affordable Care Act changed all of that. And her story is not an individual one. Her family, she, she has the care that she needs, uh, the coverage that she needs, and we cannot take that away from her. But the stories are the most powerful. So if you have a story, please tell it. And if you know of a story, have your friend tell it. But mostly what I want you to do, in addition to that, is call a friend who lives in a Republican state or a Republican district, even within this state, and have them say, this is what this means to me. This is what it means to my daughter, my son, my husband, uh, my mother, because it is going to make a tremendous difference. You know, in, the, in terms of the Medicaid that, the, that uh, Bruce, was talk, uh, Bruce Siegel was talking about, it will close nursing homes. Over 60% of the funding for people in nursing homes and home care, too, you know, some uh, people are at home, but they still get care from, uh, from Medicaid. Over 60% of it comes from Medicaid. So when they cut Medicaid in this horrible, terrible way, it has a big impact. People think of Medicaid poor kids. No, Medicaid poor kids, yes, they will suffer. But Medicaid middle income seniors in nursing homes are getting care at home. It it's, will have a tremendous impact on what families can do for their children but in relationship to what they need to do uh, for their seniors. So it is, so tell us, tell the story, call a, a member of Congress. Now, if you're calling a Republican senator, if you live in New York, they don't care. The same thing in California. They, they, it has to be their own constituents. Mm -hmm. Does anybody know anybody who lives in a state that has a Republican senator? <laughs> so when you go home, call that person and tell them to make two calls, to call their own congressperson and call their senator. Because if they pass this bill, God forbid, mm -hmm. on um, Wednesday or Thursday, Thursday. whenever, mm -hmm. they're going to send it right over to the House, and then it can go right to the president. And you, do you think, I mean, having done this, you had to do it with, you know, we all remember the process. You, you worked through that House bill. It went to the Senate. And then you had the job of steering that Senate bill back through the House. And it can be, yeah. that is when a lot of Very people hard. are sort of theorizing it could die. But do you think that there's a real threat that this bill, as, as the Senate bill has written, as the Senate has written it, could pass the House? Well, we don't know what it is yet. I mean, this, uh, the, from what we have seen so far, um, you hear what people say. Uh, let me do the substance and let me do the politics. Mm -hmm. The policy, the politics, and the American people, the most important factor in all of this, the three Ps. On the policy, it's devastating, but it's not bad enough for the extreme radical right wing in the Congress, in the Senate, and in the House. They're just saying it doesn't go far enough and all. They don't believe in a government role. This is the deconstruction of government. Medicare should wither on the vine. Medicaid should be capped and cut and diminished. Social Security will take away the disabilities benefits. That's not really hurting Social Security. Oh, yes, it is. President Bush even wanted to privatize Social Security. So it's a, it's a pattern of deconstruction of government. And deconstructing this Affordable Care Act is what they're doing. But in the meantime, they're going worse. More people will lose health insurance than gained it out of the Affordable Care Act because they are using the occasion to take down these other things. So the bill that is there now, people, they say one thing, but what it, nobody knows what's in the mind of Mitch McConnell. Mm -hmm. Say he doesn't have the votes. <laughs> Hopefully he does. <laughs> <laughs> if he doesn't have the votes, does he pull the bill? If he doesn't have the votes, does he just let it go? Because what everybody thinks is that Mitch just wants to get on to tax reform mm -hmm. and he just wants oh, to get Oh, more tax it. cuts. More tax cuts. Yeah. More tax cuts. And he thinks they'll do that in a second and send it to the president, House and Senate, vote on that, send it to the president. And they want that, what they call an accomplishment, which will increase uh, the deficit, uh, ignore the needs of the American people without going, let me stay with health care. Chuck says... <laughs> That's a 50-50 chance. 
Democratic leader of the Senate, Schumer, says that there's a 50-50 chance. Yeah. He said that on TV this morning. That's a little bit scary, but it's probably very realistic. Mm -hmm. So we just have to make sure that people know, the senators know, that people know what this means in their lives, because that's the only thing that really matters. How does it affect people's lives? So on the political side, so the policy, on the, and people, on the uh, political side, they may sell a political bill of goods. Why would anybody vote for this? Why would anybody vote for this except that it is a, um, the, the stick together on it? And again, I don't want to question their motivation, although this being Sunday, I always say, you all pray in church on Sunday and then you pray on people the rest of the week. I just don't get it. <laughs> So I'm watching the clock, and I want to make sure that we get your questions in as well. So I think uh, the good folks here at the Night Second Wire are going to start to pass me the cards so that we can also have the questions that you have for Leader Pelosi. Um, but I have to ask you, um, you know, did you ever think that you would see the day um, when the Republican Party, which during the Ronald Reagan era was, you know, Reagan was tear down that wall, Mr. Gorbachev, that, that, the, that, that you would see the Republican Party essentially ex excuse, or at least not actively push back against a president who may have, may have, his campaign may have colluded with Russia to get himself elected, but at minimum, the incredible affinity toward Russia, wanting to give back the compounds that were taken from them uh, by President Obama in sanctions. What do you make of this? Well, it is funny because it, well, it isn't funny, but it is uh, curious that so many Republicans who are so hard line against Russia, the Soviet Union, and then Russia are acquiescing, but some are speaking out. Mm -hmm. But my question is, what do the Russians have, what does Vladimir Putin have on Donald Trump, politically, personally? <laughs> I ask this question several times a week, politically, personally, or financially, that this president of the United States would come into office, kowtow to Putin, put him on a pedestal, besmirching our values as a country, mm -hmm. flirting with the idea of not doing the sanctions on Russia for their aggression into uh, Eastern Europe, and then going to, going to NATO, to the dedication of a building dedicated to the spirit of 9-11 and not embracing Article 5, which is mutual defense of each other. The only time Article 5 has been evoked, invoked, has been when they came to join us in the fight after 9-11. That's the only time. And he went there, and it was in his speech, but he decided to skip it. Now he's saying, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, but the president has to know that words, his words weigh a ton. And when he omits something like that, it has a tremendous impact. So hopefully uh, there's some maturation going on there in terms of uh, understanding. <laughs> but I'll just say this before we go to the questions, because I spent the week, uh, not the weekend, but a day yesterday in Hyannisport, we had a big Democratic fundraiser, if I just may say, with the Kennedy family and, and Joe Kennedy, who's magnificent and wonderful, he's so fabulous. He took the lead on it, and it just beautifully the way he spoke from the values of his family and, his, and our country. But, what I said to them there was, uh, because um, some of the speaker questions and all were about foreign policy, I said, you know, I was pro probably the only member of Congress left there who was at John F. Kennedy's inauguration. I was a student, and uh, my husband Paul was there also. We weren't together. We didn't even know each other at the time. But in any event, uh, that would come later. But the, um, <laughs> the and, and in his speech, you know, the whole world knows, you know from history, it was my youth, that he said to the citizen of America, ask not what our country can do for you, but what we, you can do for your country, right? You remember that, everybody knows it. They, they read it in, in the history books, if not uh, remembering. The very next sentence, the very next sentence in the speech is, to the citizens of the world, ask not what America can do for you, but what we can do working together for the freedom of mankind. A really beautiful sentiment about respect, not condescension or we're doing you a favor, 
that respect. And it is, um, it's such a contrast to, to what we saw in this inaugural address, but nonetheless in this policy as well. But America is great, and our greatness will help us withstand anything. Mm -hmm. God is always with us, my pastor tells me, and that will help us withstand almost anything as we try to minister to the biblical needs uh, of the poor. But it is, uh, it is stunning to see how he has just kowtowed to Russia. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I don't like to spend a lot of time talking about him. I do want to talk about his policies and how they hurt the American people, and people should, uh, should know that. All right, well, question two is going to be about him, but I'm going to put it to number two. Um, so we, we have a question here. Before I get to this question, I have to ask you this question, because you know a, a lot of Democrats um, are using the I word, talking impeachment. Impeachment begins yeah. in the House of Representatives. Right. Is it realistic to have a discussion about impeachment with Republicans who are backing Trump up to the hilt and getting what they want with him there? Is it realistic for liberals, for Democrats, to be talking about impeachment right now? Impeachment, again, I served on many years on the uh, um, Ethics Committee in the Congress, and any of these kinds of issues depend on one thing, the facts and the law, and in the House, the rules of the House, but the facts and the law. And it's really important for us to have an independent outside commission to look into all of this. We have a special counsel within the Justice Department reporting to Trump appointees, we ha and that, it's good that we have the counsel, don't get me wrong, I, I'm fully supportive and respectful of that, but it's within the Justice Department. Within the Republican Congress, we have the Senate and House investigations uh, in the Intelligence Committee, now perhaps Judiciary as well, and the Senate, and that's important too, but we can only go as fast as the slowest ship, which is the willingness of the Republicans to issue subpoenas. Mm -hmm. But there seems to be some bipartisanship as we're going there, and that's good. But we need, that's inside the Congress, inside the Justice Department, what we need is an outside independent commission to review the facts so that the American people know whatever happened, we know one thing for sure. The Republicans, excuse me, the Republicans are not willing to see the president's tax returns, to get, uh, vote for an outside commission. Why are, they, why are they hesitant to just find the facts? let the American people know the truth. So here's the thing. We do know for a fact that the Russians hacked, probably altered, leaked, disrupted our system, and more. They could do it again. They're doing it in other countries. The American people have it right. The integrity of our democracy is something that is part of the Constitution that we take an oath to protect and defend. We have to have the facts if it would ever lead to an impeachment. Now, in a Republican Congress, I don't think it would be, I think the president would have to cross certain lines mm -hmm. in terms of breaking the law uh, before they would move to that. But if you don't have the facts, now we have lots of dots. If we could have the outside, it could be just exculpatory. It could, it could say this came very close, this, this, that. But we need the facts. You just can't impeach because you don't like somebody's attitude or something. It right. has to be based uh, on the facts. But there is, now, I myself am part of a suit on the uh, emoluments. This was so, this was so important to our founders that they put it in the Constitution of the United States that a president, an elected official, none of us can accept a gift from a foreign government unless the Congress said they could. Mm -hmm. So I'm half, some of my members are tempted to say, let's put up a bill that says the president can accept gifts from foreign governments and see who votes for <laughs> that. <laughs> It'd probably get a lot of votes. Okay, so first question um, from an audience uh, <laughs> member here. Should President Obama have done more once he found out about the Russian interference in the election, in your view? Yeah. You worked very closely with President Obama. Yeah. Well, the, it, what they knew and when they knew it in terms of, of all of this is um, something that I think we'll learn more about. They made a judgment. Uh, they made a judgment. No, I knew at the Democratic Convention in July in Philadelphia, the first day I spoke at the, um, the big breakfast, they have the, the Christian Science Monitor breakfast, mm -hmm. big deal. All the press, and I said to them, 
This is a fact. The, Republic, the Republicans won't admit to this, but this is a fact. The Russians have hacked our system. I don't know that from classified information or else I wouldn't be able to share it with you. I know it because I had to spend money to find out who was hacking our system. Mm -hmm. That was it. It took until about October before all of the elements of the government of, of, uh, of uh, intelligence except the FBI, mm -hmm. made a statement that this was the fact. Um, whether, I, I, I just don't know enough about why a decision was made one way or another, but I think that uh, the president would probably have something to say about that. But it, is, it isn't as if no, nobody knew. I don't know what the president could have done about it. Mm -hmm. We, the four of us, uh, McConnell, and then Harry Reid, Pelosi, and Ryan sent a letter to all of the state uh, jurisdictions. That make, in some states, it's the Secretary of State, others, other jurisdictions, saying we have all of this information, all of this uh, uh, capability available to help you protect your system. Uh, the Republicans wouldn't go so far as to declare it what we call critical infrastructure. They just didn't want us to do that. Mm -hmm. The administration of Ob President Obama did declare it critical. So they did some things, but uh, clearly we want some more answers yeah. about that. Um, someone in the audience would like to know, have you met with Donald Trump since he's been elected? And if so, what was your impressions of him? <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell anybody I told you this. <laughs> <laughs> We're in your living room, right? It's just us. So we go to the first meeting with the president. This is historic. House and Senate, Democrat and Democratic and Republican leadership to meet with the new president of the United States. This is a big deal. I went to this meeting with George, President George W. Bush. I met, went to this meeting with Barack Obama twice. Now we're with the new president of the United States. So usually that meeting would be in the cabinet room or in the Oval. It was in the East Wing because he wanted to have like a little hospitality, pigs and blankets and kosher meatballs. <laughs> but that, you know, first he charms, right? So uh, in, in any event, bless him for his warmth and hospitality. <laughs> so we sit down finally at the table President of the United States, House and Senate, top leadership. You know I won the popular vote. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> First words out of his mouth. You know I won the popular vote. Now, I'm a very courteous person, and I get criticized sometimes for curbing some of my enthusiasms, but in the interest <laughs> of, a, of a respecting people who voted for people who are in these offices. But I thought, well, you know, he seems a little casual about this, so I'll be a little casual about it, too. And I said, Mr. President, that isn't true. <laughs> <laughs> And there is no evidence, fact, or data to support what you are saying. Oh, yeah, three to five million people voted illegally. I said, well, it's simply not true. You, you can't support that. Then he says, and I'm not even counting California. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, well, here's my thing. I, I look forward to working with you on infrastructure and tax reform and other subjects. Uh, the, um, but when I've worked with President Bush and we got many things accomplished, and I'll tell you what they are if you want to hear, I told him about the biggest energy bill in our history of our country, the emissions cafe standards, like taking millions of cars all through, all that. I said, but we, and even working with the Republicans, what, we, we have our disagreements, but at least we agree to a set of facts. We <laughs> stipulate whether it's a budget number or just a set of facts as to how we will then negotiate. So if you're not going to stipulate to a fact, it's really going to be very hard for us to come to terms. Yeah. 
Well, and, and I said, well, in, infrastructure. We can work together on infrastructure. Then he turns, uh, and he, uh, well, I won't go into the rest of the conversation <laughs> because it involved other people. But then the Republicans, for some reason, I don't know, they went out and said to the press, the president said he won the popular vote. You would think they might you know, <laughs> keep that like a family secret. I mean, we don't, but, but, and, but we don't even talk politics in the White House. You, minim, you keep to a minimum any political references, even, as I say, under the dome. So then they, he go out and tell the press that. So then when Chuck went out, I left early because we had votes in the House side and I excused myself. The senators didn't have a vote and the speaker doesn't vote. So I was, you know, I was the one who left early. So anyway, when I get to the Capitol, um, after all this happens, well, Chuck goes out next and the press say to him, the president, the, the, the Republican said that, 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 that. And he said, yeah, Nancy said it wasn't true. <laughs> So he gave me my out. Now I could talk about what happened. And when the press asked me, what did you think? I said, what I thought was, here he is, the president of the United States. Why so insecure? And I prayed for him. But more importantly, I prayed for the United States of America. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. So back on the subject of health care. Um, and this is a question I, I hear frequently, especially in social media. Why can't the Democrats, this question I want to know, put forward a solid single-payer health care plan as a way to counteract the terrible Republican plan? Well, as, as I've said, I've been carrying signs for single-payer long before I was in Congress and before many of the people advocating for single-payer were born. I mean, this is an idea that if we had a tabula rasa, if we were just starting clean, would be the most cost-effective way to go forward. We don't have that. Overwhelmingly, over 120-some, 50 million probably people in our country have employer-based access to, uh, their, their, uh, uh, to their health coverage and insurance. But here's what I say, because again, I come from that advocacy. And as a former chair of the party, I've always been dissatisfied what happens with our elected officials. I mean, it's never enough. But um, we put a, a public option in our House bill, which survived this House Senate process. We put it in there, and states can take up a public option, which they could grow into anything in their state. Single payer, for example, in California passed one House there, the Senate, and it would cost $400 billion. And more than half of that money would come, if they could even get the other half, more than one half of that money would come from the Affordable Care Act, mm. which pours in over, two, you know, over $200 million a year into big states. New York gets a ton of money from the Affordable Care Act. So right now, I'm going to be crude because now we're in my living room, so I can be crude. <laughs> it isn't helpful to tinkle all over the Affordable Care Act right now. Right now, we have to support the Affordable Care Act and defeat what the Republicans are doing. The path to public option single payer is in the Affordable Care Act. It is not in distracting us from the focus of stopping what they are doing to let people die. Pe people will die, make America sick again with their bill. So that is what the fight is right now. So I, I just plead with people to say, God bless you for that, keep it up. It's a, it, and we had, by the way, in our initiatives when we were do, putting this bill together, but you could buy into Medicare 55 and over, lost by one vote in the Senate. Joe Lieberman. Um, I'm not naming any names. <laughs> I do too. So, you know, all these folks who are saying, why can't we do that, and, you know, in the Senate who are saying that, I'm like, well, you know, we, we were going down that path before. Yep. But it is, um, the, many, even though we didn't get single payer, please know this, many of the features of the Affordable Care Act, of, of single payer, are contained in the Affordable Care Act. Our essential benefit package are all the guarantees and states can, 
the secretary and others can do more, but they must do the essential package. In the Republican bills, House and Senate, they're making that discretionary. It's like Punch's pilot. They don't want to vote in the Senate to say, we destroyed it. They're saying it, we're passing it on to the states to decide. So, so some of these states we live in, you might want to move. Yeah. But, but it <laughs> is, um, it's just like, I don't want, I, they know it's bad. They don't want to have the full responsibility for it, so they pass it well, on. Well, I'm wondering, though, given that Donald Trump is sort of, um, sort of I'll, I'll just put it on myself and say a bit needy in terms of flattery, in terms of you know, people praising him, do you think he would be susceptible from an argument by yourself and uh, Senate Minority Leader Schumer to go to him and say, you know, Mr. President, here are some fixes to the Affordable oh, Care yeah. Act. If you go with us, yeah. Forget those, you know, 40 uh, Tea Party Republicans who won't work with you. We'll get a bill through. Do you think he would go for that? Well, I hope so. He said something to that effect this morning. But, mm -hmm. you know, says one thing one day, another, another. But, but I was, I'll, I'll glom on to the positive thing that he said. But here's the thing. The only, these two bills, the House and Senate bills, are grotesque. There's no way that you can make them okay. They're a grotesque. What you can do, though, is to say, what are some of the features of the Affordable Care Act, which are in the bill, but have expired, but the Republicans would not extend, like reinsurance and risk cards and all that kind of thing. So we know what we need to do to renew some of the things that were there, learn from the implementation, how do we get many more young people to participate in the rest, and listen to some ideas they may have. They have some ideas left to their own devices that are not great, they're not good, they would not be a good substitute for the Affordable Care Act, but within the Affordable Care Act, add them in. It, it's, just so long as you have other options, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. So I thought right from the start that we could go do something like that, call it whatever you want, take credit for what you've changed, uh, credit for what you added rather than just subtracted, and the way to, the path to that is to defeat these terrible bills. Mm -hmm. And that's why we need everyone to tell a story, call their congressperson, call their senator, Republicans, and say, this is what this means. And I want you to know, because let's just hope that they're operating on not enough information not enough information. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to do a quick lightning round because I want to get these last three questions in. The first one is, uh, given that the Democratic Party is the party of most young, we have about 10 more minutes, uh, is the party of most young people, people of color, LGBT individuals, and religious minorities, should the leadership team make it a priority to diversify itself on those counts? Are you kidding? Our, our leadership is so diverse. But let me brag about my caucus. Our caucus is... Um, over 50% women, minorities, and LGBT community members. So we're very proud of that. At our table, which are our ranking members, it's Sparkles, Maxine Waters, uh, 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 Linda, uh, but I, I could just read you a list of John Conyers, Benny Thompson, uh, Nydia Velasquez, uh, so many uh, women of color and, and diverse members of that ranking member table. That's real, that's real power because they are the top Democrats on their committees. And in our leadership, uh, in our leadership, the second, third ranking Democrat is, uh, uh, is Mr. Clyburn, Jim Clyburn of, of South Carolina. Uh, uh, Joe Crowley is our, our chair of the caucus. You should be very proud of him in New York. He's wonderful. Linda Sanchez. Linda Sanchez is the vice chair of the caucus. She was formerly the chair of the Hispanic caucus. The chair of the, uh, whom I just, I named a new 30-something, uh, 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 Eric Swalwell is a co-chair with Rosa DeLauro of the Steering and Policy Committee. Uh, uh, the uh, Barbara Lee and Jared Polis are vice co-chairs. Jared Polis uh, uh, in the LGBT community and uh, Barbara Lee, as you know, in the Congressional Black Caucus. Then we have elected by the members, there are three leaders on the messaging. Hakeem Jeffries, wow, he's so fabulous. 
uh, David Cicilline, a leader in the LGBT, LGBTQ community, and uh, 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 just an incredible, credible woman uh, from from Illinois uh, is, is is in the in the lead in mm -hmm. terms of what we're doing. So we have women, minorities, and, and the rest. And then the, the people who are been elected by uh, Colleen Hanabuso, she's Japanese American, is the representative of the freshmen. Uh, one of the elected from the group is uh, uh, Tony Cardenas, who, who's in there. And um, I, I didn't say Sherry Bustos' name, but Sherry Bustos from the Midwest, representing rural America as we do our messaging. So we have a very, very diverse caucus. And by the way, I'm a woman <laughs> <laughs> at the top of it. So, and, but and but this, I just say that mm -hmm. the art, the uh, uh, reason I did Eric Swallow is Eric is going around the country with our 30-somethings. Mm -hmm. Grace Meng, who's now one of the vice chairs, along with, um, with Keith Ellison of the Democratic National Committee, are uh, doing so many things at the grassroots level. But Grace Meng is part of the 30-somethings group that's going around the country listening to the college students, the rest, as the people closest uh, mm -hmm. to their age. And they'll be very much a part of putting together uh, the message because, as you said, it's a diverse group. And some of these people, you know, I talk, listen to them all over the country too, and they've said to me, we really rather people listen to us rather than coming in and saying, here's a movie star, now vote the way he or she right. wants you to vote. Yeah. The young people, that, they're very straightforward yep. in all of that. Well, and I think one of the other big concerns that people have is voter suppression. This next question is about that, and it is, what is the Democratic Party planning to do about voter suppression uh, in the upcoming elections in 2018 and 2020? This is really important. Thank you for the question, and I just want to just relate it to what happened in the uh, specials that happened, but first let me directly answer the question. About 14, 15 months ago, Terry McAuliffe, who's the chair, uh, chair, who at the time was the chairman of the Democratic Governors Association, now he's the chairman of the Governors Association, right? he said, you know, you and I have uh, a, a shared mission, that is to elect more Democrats to the Congress and more, and more governors to the state houses and more state legislatures. So we should be working in a more collaborative fashion. We put together a program to do this, took it to the convention, it was about stopping voter suppression, which is happening in these states, so blatantly and almost with proud, pridefully, you know, I feel like when you go to heaven, you very devout people, when you go to heaven and you see our founders there, how are you gonna say to them, I did everything in my power to make sure people couldn't vote <laughs> in a democracy. And it's, it's shameful what they're doing. It is shameful whether it's limiting number of voting places, limiting the hours, limiting the early voting that could go in. It's shameful what they're doing. So in any event, President Obama became interested. Of course, we thought we'd be operating under President Hillary Clinton at this time, but all the more reason for this to happen. So the president has tasked um, Eric Holder, Attorney General Holder, to be his sort of representative at the table, and he's chairing our efforts. It's about what I said earlier, voter suppression, uh, uh, redistricting some of that, some of the states are ripened uh, to go to court. The suppression is some court, some electoral process of electing state legislatures and governors. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, all of this to elect a Democratic Senate and Democratic House. But the purpose of the group is not just political, it's patriotic. Because this isn't about Democrats or Republicans, it's about our system, it's about our democracy. And we don't wanna go in there and do to them what they did to us. We're saying no, just have an objective redistricting, whether that's by commission, or whether it's by having it very clear from the courts what judgments they will make if the redistricting is too political mm -hmm. or is too um, racial. Because what they do racially is that. Now how it relates to these races, now I just wanna say this because some of you maybe brought these questions and they haven't come forth yet. These elections were districts we would never have chosen. They were overwhelmingly Republican, but they were chosen by Donald Trump. When he selected his cabinet, it was with the idea that certainly Republicans would be elected uh, to fill those seats. The public would not just stand by. We were not running away from any fights, so working together, 
uh, these races took place. It's important to note this. While we came close in Georgia and in South Carolina and in, in Kansas, we took off almost 30 points, I mean 25 points, from what they had done in the previous election. Uh, it was about around 71, say let's say over 70, but around 71 points that we had cut back their margins. Now that wasn't enough to win the seats, but it's a great deal for those Democrats in those states as they go out to do state legislative races and their governor's races, as well as running again in Congress, who made all of those which were double digit 20, 30 points advantage in the previous election to six or seven points or two or three points. Mm -hmm. And um, these are now races that we may take a look at. But some of them will be impossible unless there's fair redistricting. Unless there's fair redistricting. Right. And so in some of those states that are ripened, and I won't say what they are now because that's up to the uh, stealth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, when the time comes, uh, the, uh, the states will be announced as to where we will go. Mm -hmm. But it is about making your best case probably ending up in the Supreme Court on all of those things. And the voter suppression is, is, you know what one of the biggest suppressors of the vote is? In addition to mechanics that they use, and like in Virginia, they say you have to fax your photo ID. Right. Who has a fax machine anyway? Right. <laughs> you have to fax your photo ID. One of the biggest suppressors of the vote is big, dark money in politics. It just, it just suffocates the airways. Mm -hmm. And the people are like, well, I don't know. You know, they're saying this, they're saying that. I don't know. It just turns people off yep. who should be voting. So this is the final question uh, of our evening tonight, and it is Speaker Pelosi, and you might have been able to anticipate this one, are we ever going to have a woman president? And this person would like suggestions, names, <laughs> of who that might be. Are we ever, I always thought that the American people are so much more ready for a woman president than the pecking order in the Congress for over 200 years would ever be for a woman speaker. Now, no much, the speaker is the third president, vice president, speaker of the house. It's a constitutional office and it is very important. Most people don't really realize it and I don't know that I, I was busy working, I should have been celebrating it more, <laughs> something to say, look how important I am. But, but here's the thing, in the Congress, it's, it's like, I mean, for 200 years they've been standing in line, next time, next time, next time, and we got in line and said, hey, wait a minute, we've been waiting over 200 years, so don't tell us it's not our time. So I thought the American people were much farther ahead than the Congress in that, and that they would be more receptive. It's hard. I mean, we have, look, look at the entire Senate, look at our women governors, look at some of our members in the House of Representatives. It is, it's no longer that you have to be this, that, or the other thing. Look at, you know, look what happened in the last election. So some, somebody we may not even be thinking of could emerge uh, in that way. But, but we have to, in the press, there has to be some more receptivity to the fact that a woman can be president. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't buy into some of these arguments, a oh, woman commander in chief, how many times did I hear that? A woman commander in chief, yeah, a woman commander in chief. Mm -hmm. We've had other men who have not served in the military to be president of the United States, as we can have a woman commander in chief. But how important it would have been, I, I'm, I'm just heartbroken about Hillary Clinton not being president. She was probably better prepared than her husband, certainly better prepared than George W. Bush, and, and really better prepared than Barack Obama in terms of her experience as a senator, as a secretary of state, as a first lady, you know, all of the experience that she had. She happened to be a woman. And again, I say to women, it, this is not a zero-sum game. If one woman succeeds, it's not at your expense. It's not at your expense. If a, if a woman succeeds, that helps all of us. 
all the press, uh, communications I get from families saying, thank you for succeeding, because that opens another door for my daughter. So I think the younger generation of, of women is more receptive mm -hmm. to the success of other women. But uh, the fact that so many women did not vote for Hillary Clinton, <laughs> well, when, when he was the candidate, I mean, I, I can't even go to that place. But let me just go back to how you get to the White House. You know how they say, can you give me direction? How do I get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice. How do they get to the White House? It's not just you run now. Just be ready. And I say to the women, you really must run. As they say back to me, why would I run if I'm going to subject myself to what you're subjected to? Right. I don't want that for my family. And I say, don't, don't worry. Just know your purpose. What is your purpose? What is your vision for our country? What do you have inside of you that has all the authenticity and the uniqueness that is you? So who, what is your purpose? And my daughter, Christine, gives me a speech every day. She, she uh, mm -hmm. is always saying, you know your purpose. Your, what is your vision? What is your knowledge of the subject? If you're motivated, as I am, by the one in five children in America who lives in poverty, that just drives my engine. I pray for them in the morning, at night, work for them all day. What is your, that driving thing, what do you know about it? Is it climate? Is it income inequality? Is it um, education? Is it, what, it, what is that? Or a couple of different things. But know your subject. Know your horizon, your vision know your subject, have a plan. This is how I have, I think to get it done, how it can attract other people. Mm -hmm. If you have a vision, you have knowledge, and your judgment is respected, and you have a plan to get something done, no matter how modest, don't make it too much, make it achievable, you will attract support. And when they, the, the connection of your authenticity, your determination, women, young women, it's so, not even young, women, I went from the kitchen to the Congress when my children were grown. I was in my middle 40s, which they said I came to Congress at, at a late stage in life. And I think, <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I wasn't thinking of it that way. But nonetheless, uh, but the guys come in their early 30s. Right. So that's, you know, and they get seniority sooner and that. So please, please be, think about it. Know your power. Don't let anybody, young women, women of all ages, in the audience, and men too. I mean, this is not to say women are better than men. We need the mix. The beauty is at the mix at the table. And the, uh, when you make that decision to go, don't let anybody diminish who you are. I say this yeah. in Amen. friendship. Don't let anybody diminish who you are. Well, Leader Pelosi, I will tell you, we didn't get a name out of you. We'll have to get you to tweet out some names of ideas of candidates. We're going to end there. Do you, do you want to quickly throw out a couple of names of people you would like to see run? <laughs> well, it, it, when you name names, you don't name them all, and that's the problem. That's true. But that's I, don't, true. I have every confidence that there are wealth of people. But we have to prepare. We have to prepare the arena we're sending this person into. Absolutely. So that in, in the press and in the public perception and in the country, that people know what a statement this would make in the world and what a message it would send uh, to our daughters, our granddaughters, that anything is possible for them. But it, you know what? It's going to be a woman who happens to be a woman who's very, very qualified. Indeed. And that is, we have many candidates who could meet that test. Well, Leader Pelosi, I want to thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you all for your great questions. Thank you to the 92nd Street Y. Thank you for coming. Have a wonderful rest of your night.